Okay, let's get going. Uh, uh, the hour is, uh, is, is, is getting later in, in London. Uh, I'm John Henry. I'm the chairman of the Committee for the Republic. And <clears throat> last week, uh, many of you uh, participated in our salon about a London-centric uh, historic event 68 years ago. Uh, today, uh, we're going to turn around and uh, go in the opposite direction, and, and uh, we're going to talk about the future. Uh, instead of talking with two uh, London-based uh, filmmakers, uh, today we're talking to two London-based economists, uh, Charles Goodard and uh, Manjay Pradhan, or not just any economist, uh, they're global macroeconomists, and they're original. Uh, they aren't, uh, on the one hand, uh, economists, and on the other hand, economists, they, they actually have a thesis. And as you know, uh, conventional wisdom says that inflation uh, isn't a problem. We can take comfort uh, that low inflation uh, is here to stay. Our uh, two uh, speakers um, uh, disagree with this. They say the future is going to be very different uh, than the past. They say uh, great inflation is around the corner and we'll talk about what the corner is. Uh, so you're in for a real treat here. Um, we're gonna have uh, uh, a China salon, uh, a supply chain salon, uh, an aging salon in addition to an uh, inflation salon. Uh, now, Charles, for years, uh, chaired uh, banking and finance at the London School of Economics uh, after a long career at the Bank of England. Uh, for his lasting contributions to the field of monetary economics, he uh, was elected a fellow of the coveted British Academy and won uh, the Senior British Empire Award. And that award is the Commander of the Order of the British Empire. More evidence more if you evidence. need any, more evidence than if you need any, that the uh, English are the world's best title makers. Charles, uh, for years, was a fixture uh, of Hong Kong's economic governance. Uh, Charles consulted for years with Morgan Stanley, where he hit, uh, hooked up with uh, Manche, uh, and who headed the Morgan Stanley's uh, global economics team. Manjay left uh, Morgan Stanley to found the London-based research firm Talking Heads Macroeconomics. Talking Heads can advise you when, whenever you need uh, on your next uh, financial market move in global uh, and emerging markets. He has the, uh, he's got a lot of uh, options he can give you. Uh, so I ask you to uh, join me in welcoming our guest speakers who will help us pierce the fog of the future. Thank you very much, John. Uh, We're going to do slides, which is uh, something we haven't done before. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Uh, if you're going to look into the future, you actually have to go back to the past to see what that tells you. And I'd like to start by reminding everyone how extraordinary the monetary conditions of the last 70 years have been. If you take my country, the UK, very long dated, in fact, undated uh, government debt known as consuls from the time that the Bank of England was founded <coughs> in 1694 until about 1950. Uh, the price and the yield of such consuls remained really quite remarkably steady uh, through all kinds of vicissitudes, uh, wars and what have you. Uh, and the yield on consoles remained fairly constant at about three and three quarter to four percent, and the price remained remarkably steady. Then in 1950, uh, the yields went way up. Now, what that meant was that before 1950, the expectation was uh, that inflation and with it future short term interest rates would remain relatively stable. From 1950 onwards, that ceased to be held true. And you got the great inflation from 1950 until about 1980. And from that time onwards, after Paul Volcker 
uh, turned inflation around with the assistance of Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher in this country, uh, the expectations of inflation and expectations of future short rates and yields and long rates came steadily trending downwards. Now, all that was a great deal to do with the monetary regime that we had, uh, the gold standard, uh, and followed by Bretton Woods. And then you got the collapse of Bretton Woods in the 1970s, the abandonment of the gold standard. And it was combined with the fact that many of those in power at the time had grown up during the Great Depression and regarded unemployment as the great evil and were prepared to make the economy run effectively about as hot as they thought it could and to restrain any inflationary pressures by prices and incomes policies, which didn't work. And then we got, uh, after Paul Volcker, the change in policies and a much better monetary regime with central bank independence and inflation targets. But the point that we made was that during these last 40 years from 1980 onwards, it actually wasn't that hard for central banks to hit their inflation target, as evidenced by the fact that short-term interest rates during this period were trending steadily downwards. And indeed, after the great financial crisis in 2009-10, uh, effectively, central banks, despite trying to throw the kitchen sink at the problem, failed to get inflation even back to target. So there was something else going on, some disinflationary context. And we argue that a key feature of that disinflationary target to, uh, to, uh, context uh, was the globalization uh, that was going on at the time. Now, in this chart, you can see on the left-hand side, the blue line shows the change, the, uh, initially the rate of growth, the number of those of working age population in the advanced economies of the world. The yellow line above it shows the, those of working age population uh, in the countries with low wages that then joined the advanced economies into the world's trading system. This was primarily China, but it was also the Eastern European countries after the collapse uh, of the Iron Curtain and the Soviet Union. And what you can see is that the numbers available in working age population uh, meant that those who could move their production, whether of goods and services, from one country to another, effectively could double the ac their access to those of working age population uh, by shifting production uh, to China and, and Eastern Europe, where wages were a great deal lower. And again, on the right-hand side, you can see the increase uh, in the working age population from year to year, which increased steadily until about 2010, and now is going to really decline, or rather the increase is going to decline quite sharply, uh, particularly if you exclude Africa, which we'll talk about uh, the, the potentiality of the rising populations in Africa uh, at a later date. Now, such globalization shifting production to low wage, but effectively operated, effectively administered countries with reasonably well-educated workers uh, was disinflationary for three main reasons. The first one was obviously a shifting production from high wage to low wage. The second reason was that employers in the high wage countries now had a credible threat whenever the workers argued and sought higher wages. They could say that if you go on insisting for higher wages, I'm afraid we're going to have to shift our production to Vietnam uh, as well as China uh, or Poland or Hungary uh, in Eastern Europe. And that was a credible threat. And all that meant that production was shifting, particularly in the advanced economies, from manufacturing uh, where workers are relatively well organized into trades unions, into services where they're not well organized. And both a symptom and a cause of the decline in labor bargaining power over the last uh, 40 years uh, has been uh, the decline in 
private sector trades union membership. Uh, back in the 1970s, the National Union of Mine Workers in the UK was a force to be reckoned with, as was the UAW uh, in the United States. Where are they now? The NUM now really hardly exists any longer. And the, the ability of private sector trades unions uh, to threaten strikes uh, if their demands are not met are, are tending to disappear. Now, besides the effect of globalization, the other major influence has been demography. And again, demography has been uh, very disinflating. And again, particularly in China. Uh, in very simple terms, uh, workers have to pr produce in value more than they're paid in wages. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worthwhile employing them in the first place. Uh, moreover, uh, they have to save for their retirement. So an increase in the share of workers uh, is disinflationary. While the young and the old consume but they don't produce and are therefore inflationary. Now, what you see, particularly with China, in the period from 1970 up to 2010, is a massive decline in the birth rate and the proportion of the young. As the baby boom passed over, um, uh, and as in China, the one child policy took uh, effect. Now, this had a double uh, implication. The first implication was, of course, there were many more uh, people of working age relative to the young. And the second was that many, many more women were now able to join the workforce, whereas previously they'd have to be looking after their children uh, and doing all the home activities, which consumer durables were now uh, making less hard. And the decline in the number of the young vastly uh, distance the rise in the number of the retirees. Uh, in every country bar Japan, in the period between 1970 and 2010, and particularly note in China, so that the, demogra the demographic benefit to China was greater than almost anywhere else. In China, the uh, proportion of the old between 1970 and 2010 was really growing relatively slowly at a much lower level than in the advanced economies, as you can see. Now, all this is changing now and changing quite sharply. Uh, birth rates have remained very low um, and the share of the young in the population is now below 20%, below about the uh, sustainable rate uh, in our economies, while well, the number of retirees are growing very sharply from now on, and the share of working age population uh, is actually now declining after having risen uh, very sharply. Moreover, of course, as I've indicated earlier, uh, the shift of production uh, from the high wage economies of North America and Europe and Australia to the low wage economies, uh, nevertheless efficiently run in Asia, particularly China and Eastern Europe, had a major effect uh, on inequality in the world and in our individual countries. And for that, I will now pass on to Manoj. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, um, John, thanks for having us here and giving us a chance to talk to um, your colleagues about our thesis. Um, I'm going to take off where Charles left, walk you through some of the social impacts and a little bit on China before I turn it back over to, uh, to Charles. So the, the, the shock that we're, we're talking about really in our book we have described as once in history, an event that uh, doubled the working age um, labor supply to about by about 120% over a short period of a decade or so and that really gave us the boost. Now, what was happening in the background was a very, very, very dynamic story of inequality. If you look at history, for most of history, China has been the dominant country uh, in the world. It's only over the last 200 years or so that things changed and changed dramatically, particularly after the Industrial Revolution. And over that period, it's the countries that we now brand the advanced economies that had raced ahead, while the rest of the world was really living at very subsistence level of wages. 
But over the last 30 or 40 years, a pretty dramatic change has been taking place. And this table that we've got is, Charles and I agree, is probably one of the most dramatic bits of information that you will find. And it shows you that as uh, recently as the year 2000, the ratio of wages of an American worker to a Chinese worker was about 35. Within a period of 18 years, and that process is still continuing to some extent at the slowest speed, that ratio has gone to five times. It's a factor of seven over a 20 year period. And it's a most incredibly dramatic catch up that we have seen, mostly because of this rapid integration of China's labor force and their ability to conduct investment pra practically on behalf of the world. So what you saw over this period was that global inequality was actually falling. And it's a point that Milanovic has made in, in his writings very eloquently. Uh, you see the same thing happening within Europe, between France and Eastern Europe, Poland in this case, but to a much slower extent, it's really the starting point and the dramatic integration of China, which has been the standout story. But while that has been a beneficial part of the story as far as the global economy is concerned, the impact in the advanced economies has been far less generous. So this is the chart from Otur in his American Economic Association review paper. He has um, the labor force in the US distributed by education levels. And what you see here is the shock to lower skilled, lower income workers when faced with competition from China and emerging markets has been to make them significantly more vulnerable. These are the cumulative earnings in the uh, real weekly earnings of adults. And you can see that those with a lower education have been significantly hurt by the entry we feel of China um, and Eastern Europe. And in fact, their integration into the global uh, labor force. Now, this is a problem that has in many places led to populism because what you would normally expect is that the working class would be attracted to um, the left side of uh, the political spectrum. But the far right, uh, who generally tend to be far more against immigration than most mainstream parties, were able to capture a significant amount of this vote um, by uh, uh, partly rightly and partly wrongly uh, adjust, uh, adjusting their views to take into account immigration and its effects on uh, overall uh, weekly earnings. Now that said, this is not a story that's different in China itself. So if you've, if you've seen the recent fortunes of billionaires in China um, and the less fortunate ones who are still stuck in the interior of the country, the change in fortunes within China has been dramatic as well. But I'm gonna turn, before I turn it back over to Charles, to a little bit of a preview or a little bit of a review of what China is doing itself. So China is so important to our story on the way in that our first chapter after the introduction is devoted entirely to China. And there we lay down our view about the role it has played in the past and the role it's gonna play in the future. During the great inflation, there were two things that had an equal, I would say perhaps a slightly less than equal role. And the bigger share of that was just the speed at which China's integration occurred, whether it was a WTO accession or most favored nations status uh, that the US Congress passed in 2000s, which allowed China to have that jump is, is uh, uh, of course, a joint story. But it's very difficult over the last 30 or 40 years to know whether China caused globalization or globalization caused China. Most people would tend to believe that it's China that has led to a dramatic surge in globalization. But it's that integration of China's labor force into the overall labor structure that really moved the needle. During the reversal, these next 20 or 30 years, its role is important, but it doesn't stand out as much. So if you compare it to my earlier statement that it's not only China's demography, but also its integration that mattered, on the way from here, you will not see a withdrawal of China from the uh, global manufacturing system. Yes, there are certainly gonna be challenges, political challenges, but China remains entrenched in its production. And so overall, it's global aging as a whole the North Asian complex, the Eastern European complex, and all of the advanced economies all aging together, which are really pushing the story very far ahead. What lies ahead of China, we feel, is, is, is the following. Number one, the internal migration that drove an unlimited supply of rural labor into the urban centers, and particularly into the Pearl River Delta at next to nothing wages, is probably over. 
So we think the Lewis point, which is the point at which this kind of migration begins to have more negative effects than positive ones has been reached. And it's very difficult to sustain urban cities within China with the Hukou system, which is effectively a passport that people migrating from the interiors of China to the urban centers do not have. They don't have access to the local healthcare services and the like. And the rate of growth simply isn't enough to sustain them. The urban population now accounts for about 60% of the total. This is partly because some of the rural centers that used to be rural before are now also urban, but that labor surge that we saw from the interior to the coastlines is, is pretty much done with in our view. Second, there is a lot of talk of consumption-led growth in China, but we think it's more of a myth and a numerical solution to China than an economic transformation. And what do I mean by that? Well, Japan saw a, a similar collapse in its investment cycle after a huge increase uh, in investment at a time when its labor force was also burgeoning, pretty much along the lines with China. But unlike China, Japan turned when they had already become quite prosperous. And the effect was that investment, which is the dark blue line over here, fell very sharply and very markedly, something that we've seen in China over 2012 to 2015. And like Japan, any resurgence will be very, very, very cautious and moving up. Over that time, consumption, as you would expect as economists, was handled rather in a more stable way where people wanted to keep their consumption steady. So for every year that investment was below consumption growth, consumption as a share of GDP went up, but that did not make Japan a consumption-led economy. They remain an export-driven story. They remain an investment-driven story. It's just that they now have a very high standard of living that they do their best to try and protect. And that's where we think China is going. The state-owned enterprises have spent a lot of time destroying capacity. They have stopped, if you think of productivity as capital over labor, they've stopped investing in capital and they've also moved labor from the northern part of the country into the cities to work in the gig economy. So consumption will be an important part of the Chinese economy, but only mathematically, not economically speaking. And so the end game is that we have three stories. One is there is a massive regime shift which we are living through. So over the last 30 or 35 years, we had a regime in which there were centralized productions. Think about the state-owned enterprises, decentralized political power. So the rise of Beaujolais and the provincial governors was very important. And most of the financing was internal. What China did was they blocked capital flows into their country at its borders. That's why they were able to have an independent monetary policy, which they used to move savings from the household sector to the banks, and the banks then directed it to state-owned enterprises. Today, what they've got is decentralized production. They want the private sector to try and take on as much uh, of the growth potential as they can. But of course, you see some of that clamping back down. The private sector simply does not have access to the same kind of credit that the state sector did. Uh, but political power in the same time has been centralized and that is clashing with the economics. But more and more, the Chinese are relying on external finance, which is making their life a little bit more difficult. Second, as I said, consumption-led growth is a myth, but then so is the threat of a debt crisis. Remember that the biggest problem in debt is because the government-owned banks had let lend money to state-owned enterprises, which was then invested in, in capacity, which was useless to a large extent. But both the assets and liabilities are on the state's balance sheet. So this is an internal problem that is very different from Japan again. What we expect is that this will weigh upon private sector credit, but the manufacturing sector will be able to raise productivity. And finally, with the dissaving, the current account in China, which has already moved a lot, is going to move into dissaving. And China's disinflationary impulse on the world has become significantly less, if not moving outright into an inflationary position. But to move us back into the inflation debate, I'm going to hand it back over to Charles. Thank you very much, Manoj. Um, the point that I want to make now is that the generalized aging process, which includes Asia as well as Europe and North America, uh, has meant that the public sector debt position is, has been likely to get on present policies exponentially worse now. And this has had nothing to do whatsoever with COVID. Uh, this problem about the debt position is pre-COVID 
and COVID is merely a sort of a blip on it, a bump on it. Uh, I illustrate this, or we illustrate this, with this particular chart, which was the, the Office of Budget Responsibility in the UK in 2019, before we knew anything about COVID, setting out the deficits, which are the purple lines below the, um, uh, below the horizontal, uh, including a primary deficit on present policies, leading to an exponential expected rate uh, of debt. Now, why are these deficits growing so large, largely? Again, it's because of the aging process. It's because of the need for Medicare. It's because of pensions for the old. Uh, it's for the need of uh, people to be transferred from the workforce to being carers looking after people in care homes. Now, this, of course, is not specific to the UK. It is general and it is a feature of the US as well. And here we get the same uh, US um, and you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, actually this is um, uh, not the very latest one because the latest one has a bump where the COVID crisis came, but it's the same story in the US as well. Uh, one of the things that is frequently said about debt is don't worry about it uh, because we had um, uh, just about as high or higher debt in World War II and in previous wars in the UK and the Napoleonic War, uh, and we dealt with it. But there's a difference. Uh, war was temporary, and during the historical period, the greater form of expense that the public sector ever undertook was to uh, conduct wars. And when wars were over, uh, there weren't many expenditures done by the public sector. Public sector finance uh, was relatively well balanced. And therefore, once the temporary war was over, there was a general expectation as evidenced by the yield curve that I showed, or the yields that I showed you on consoles in the first, uh, the first chart that we had, there was a general expectation uh, and a correct expectation um, that uh, inflation would remain low uh, and that the debt ratio would decline quite sharply. Now with aging, that's no longer the case because aging is structural and permanent um, and persistent uh, rather than a temporary uh, and unusual. So what's going to happen uh, with the burden that the aging process is going to impose uh, on all our economies? If we could move on to the next slide, what, what is going to happen uh, with the end game of dealing with debt? Now, the nicest way of dealing with debt is to grow out of it. One of the problems that we point out is that with the decline in the rate of growth of the working age population and an absolute decline in many countries, particularly some of the fastest growing ones like China and Germany, uh, growth is much more likely to slow down, even from the present relatively low levels, than to speed up. That is because growth is simply a combination of the increase in the number of workers interacting with the improvement in productivity that all such workers could undertake. Now, we do believe uh, that the decline in uh, globalization and a shift from offshoring production to onshoring production back in one's own countries will lead to some increase in productivity because corporations who've been able to benefit from shifting production to low wage economies have been able to make very large profit to profits uh, without having to do any investment at home, a limited amount of investment abroad, but not so much investment at home. When the shift uh, of production to offshore to countries like China is lessened, in order to hold down unit labor costs, particularly as the working force grows less fast, they will have to invest more and that will raise productivity. But we don't think that that will be a sufficient offset to bring about an increase in growth. 
Another thing that can, and indeed to a very large extent will have to happen, will be an increase in taxes. The problem here is that taxes are politically extremely unpopular, almost all of them, even those that most people think are inevitable and desirable, like carbon taxes, remember Macron's problems with the gilet jaune. Um, so that for political problems, we think that uh, taxation will not offset the increase in public sector expenditures that aging will bring about. Then again, if, the, if fiscal policy uh, doesn't stabilize the situation on debt, how about turning to monetary policy with an increase in taxation? The problem with that is the debt is so high, uh, as John indicated in his introduction at the outset, uh, that uh, it will be extremely unattractive for the public sector because of the increase in interest rate burden uh, on, on, on the public sector. And it will also be very difficult for the private sector to absorb because their debt ratios have become so very high uh, in massive increases in non-financial corporate indebtedness, particularly over recent decades with the very low interest rates. So we think that it will be very hard and unattractive either for the fiscal policy or for monetary policy to do enough to deal with the increased expenditures and reduced availability of labor that we see coming down the road. So what will happen, we feel, to resolve the debt problem is going to be inflation. However, of course, the problem of all this is when is what is the timing likely to be? And the timing when the retreat from globalization and the reduction in the rate of growth of the working population would have their full effect, it's very hard to assess. And it is certainly true that the bargaining power of labor in most of our advanced economies has been really hit fairly badly. So we were clearly not at all clear how long it would be before these underlying trends, which are, have been reversing since about 2010, would lead to a reversal uh, in the effective increase uh, in real wages. But we do think that the pandemic is probably speeding everything up because very largely of the responses to that. On the whole, we think that the policy responses of fiscal expansion and the monetary expansion that have taken place uh, from the outset of, the, uh, of coronavirus uh, and will need to continue for the next uh, quarter or couple of quarters were desirable. But, and it is a big but, they have increased the monetary aggregates enormously and many of the fiscal responses look likely to continue even to accelerate, even after the vaccines uh, bring about a degree of normalization. Uh, and we believe that given the fragile position of many of the corporates, many corporate markups will have to increase. With the result that we think that it is highly likely that there will be at any rate a blip, if not a longer period uh, of monetary expansion and inflationary pressures, which may bring the underlying trend effects of globalization and demography forward over time. I'll now hand back to Manoj to deal with some of the reasons why most of our colleagues uh, in macroeconomics do not agree with us. Thanks again, Charles. And in the interest of time, I'll be brief over here. We can always take these up in the Q&A um, where there'll be questions. But broadly speaking, and I'll spend a lot, lot more time on the last one, the first four um, are, are very difficult to assess in our view. They are unlikely to really move the needle. Mathematically, if you remember Charles's second slide, there was a dashed gray line where the working age population continued to move up. And you may have wondered what that implied for our thesis. Uh, unfortunately, not much. We think India, uh, parts of Asia, like Indonesia, parts of South America, and a lot of Africa will tend to do very well. So they have 
uh, a young population that will remain young for the next few decades. They have capital flowing in from the advanced economies. The biggest problem is the ability of those places to transform the incoming capital into output like China did and turn things around. And the reasons for that are the following. First, if you remember my earlier comments on inequality, China's long history has allowed them to have a system of guilds, a system of training, a system of business that allows a rapid transmission of technology and rapid adoption of new techniques. Until very recently, um, just before independence, in fact, India's social structures were best described as we learned in high school by the term village communism. They had become entirely segregated, not really integrated into a global national system, uh, except for brief periods where they had um, uh, kingdoms that spanned large parts of the country and hence didn't really have that system of training and apprenticeship that would allow significant uh, business expansions to flourish. If you look at Africa, it has the same population as the size of India, but 50 states. And so to have them expect a single strategic vision that spans 50 policies and strategic partnerships across the lot is just a very difficult story to visualize. So if you can't produce goods over there and you really can't import uh, labor from these advanced economies because of the very difficult potential for immigration, the chances that demography in those countries can be benign enough to change the course of the world looks difficult to us. Limiting benefits of, to the old, more participation of the elderly. This is something that has already gone on for 20 years. And in most advanced economies, the 55 to 64 year old cohort already shows participation in the high 60s or the mid 70s. It's very difficult for us to think that that participation number is going to go up after retirement. If anything, it probably slows down. And so just a, a quick word on technology, because I'm sure there'll be questions on this. The line of reasoning that we have is the following. We argue, and Charles and I both have very personal um, family um, experiences with this. We argue that robotics are not really in a position to look after the elderly directly. There's a very recent study at the NBER, which looks at nursing homes in Japan. And if anything, they show that uh, robots, simple devices to detect uh, um, ailments and the like, uh, transfer patients between beds to their wheelchairs, helped workers, but it did not lead to a destruction of the labor supply in those nursing homes at all. So if we are going to see this population increase, we're going to need a pretty hefty increase in the number of people looking after the old. It can't come through immigration. And so it must come from the rest of the country internally, which can only be done by automation destroying jobs elsewhere. So we believe that we actually need automation and robotics to destroy jobs in the country. We're not against technology. We're not technology skeptics. In fact, we argue we don't know enough about the process to really have a very strong opinion. And so finally, I'll end up with a couple of words on Japan and walk you through our conclusions. Japan is the one question that everyone has. If your thesis is so singular and so pointed at inflation, why didn't Japan inflate? Well, one of the main reasons it didn't inflate was that Japan's demography turn at the same time that China was disinflating the entire world, including Japan. So Japan imported a lot of disinflation. It imported falling interest rates and it exported business. It exported employment, investment, and production in manufacturing and services to China, to North Asia, to Poland, to Brazil, and elsewhere. With the result that what looked like a very difficult situation for the Japanese corporate sector at home actually wasn't. The Japanese corporate sector was actually quite dynamic. They understood this massive surge in labor supply that they saw before them, and they sought to protect profits rather than help the economy out, which was not their primary mandate. It was to look after their profits. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, GDP per worker has done extremely well in Japan and we should all be lucky uh, to, to try and match that. Whereas most of the adjustment in the labor force has happened not through wages, but to hours. It's something that the West cannot do. They will have to move wages when it comes to adjusting labor. So to wrap up, we think inflation is coming. We think the pandemic will accelerate its arrival, and it's doing so by bringing forward future deflation. Unlike the post-financial crisis period where central banks had injected money into the banking sector, and the banking sector was indifferent between buying government bonds, emerging markets, and lending, 
What has happened this time is that fiscal expansion has put money directly into the hands of consumers and businesses who are far more likely to spend. In fact, that's where most expect those really high personal savings rates to go. Second, we think the yield curve is going to steepen. Charles has already made a very eloquent argument for why central banks cannot hike rates. And if they don't do that, then exactly what you're seeing over the last few weeks, which is yields increasing in many places, not just the United States, is going to happen. Structurally, that means asset returns are very hard to extract. It does help with raising uh, uh, social uh, equality. It will lead to lower within country inequality, but it's not going to happen in a very, very smooth and benign fashion because growth is going to get pressured lower, as Charles had explained. And finally, one of the things that we've taken for granted, which is central bank independence coming under increasing threat. Uh, some of you may have uh, already seen some of that happening uh, with, the, with uh, the Powell and the Trump administration uh, over the last year or two. But if you paid attention over the last couple of days, the Central Bank of New Zealand has now been told by a member of uh, the administration there to include house prices in their calculation. And the market has reacted very aggressively to that move. So this reckoning between the central bank and the administration as inflation begins to increase is going to be something that we're going to have to keep a close eye on. But I'll stop it with there, John. I'll turn it right back over to you. Good. Terrific. So uh, we have uh, uh, Paul Horn. We have Julia uh, Mahoney. Uh, Julia, why don't you uh, jump in here? Um, Julia has written this uh, fabulous paper uh, uh, with uh, Ed Kitch about <clears throat> how we would restructure the debt if the uh, if inflation goes. Uh, so, Julia, jump in here. Yes. First, I have to say I think this is a magnificent book, and I can't compliment you two enough on the incredible job that you've done. Uh, I am curious, though, about the idea that you've arrived at the conclusion that inflation is inevitable in a funny way by a process of elimination. If I understand you correctly. Uh, you seem to look at some of the other possibilities of dealing with this staggering debt that we are looking at, not least run up by governments, as you point out, um, in, uh, with their social welfare programs of various sorts. You look at the alternatives and dismiss them as politically unpalatable, and so conclude that inflation is the route that the governments are going to have to take, and that what is more, uh, that, uh, that for some reason the central banks are not going to be able to fight it, that they're going to, well, their independence will be threatened if they, they push back against inflation. But I have to ask you, inflation might be politically unpalatable too. It's not clear to me that the electorate of the United States uh, would uh, prefer inflation to restructuring uh, some of the debt of the United States or inflation to uh, significant overhauls of the healthcare sector that would lead to um, to far less spending. So I just wonder how you respond to that possibility. Well, there are two answers. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very good point, but I think there are two answers to it. First, no politician will ever say that they want inflation. Uh, what they will always say is we don't want inflation and we're going to try and stop it, but they won't take the actions that will actually do so because the actions to raise a tax or to cut, uh, say, Medicare, uh, are politically unattractive. And those actions are immediately uh, the responsibility of the politicians undertaking them. While inflation is something that happens without the politician apparently wanting it. So it's politically easier to take the easy way out and not take the politically unpopular actions and have the inflation arising as a result. Uh, the second thing that I would say is that um, if you go back to the 1970s, uh, it was difficult enough uh, for Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan to take the action that did bring about an end to inflation. But at that time, the debt ratio of the public sector in the US was about 30%. And the corporates were not anywhere like as indebted as they now are. And if you start taking raising interest rates, 
with the debt levels far, far, far higher. The likelihood that you might actually drive the economy into a really quite severe financial collapse um, and recession, which of itself would not improve the debt ratio for obvious reasons, are much greater. So that I, 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 in a sense, our concern is that we may have to have enough inflation to get the debt ratio down to the kind of levels that will enable the next Paul Volcker and the next Ronald Reagan to take the necessary, but again, as you say, unpalatable steps to defeat it. Julia, I'll just add uh, two small points. I think it, it, uh, while Charles is, is spot on, obviously I agree with him on where the inflation story goes relative to uh, because of debt. I think the two of the points that we make on inflation, one is that uh, inflation is also a real phenomenon that comes through the friction between these two parts of the population. Uh, when you've got the elderly who consume a service, and, and if you look at some of the data that we see, you actually tend to see that upon retirement, consumption actually rises. It just doesn't rise on movie theaters. Obviously, we all know it rises on caring and health-related services. And so what happens is that you're not working, you create a demand for services, and then you tend to be inflationary. As the working age population becomes smaller relative to that size, the people in the economy who can create disinflationary forces by producing more they consume dwindles relative to that increasing inflationary impulse. And if you think about how you pay for that, the, the, the elderly vote. So if you look at Japan, if Japan was to have a revolution, they wouldn't throw Molotov cocktails they'd go to the polls and elect a government that protects their rights. And if they did that, then the part where the workers would have to be taxed to some extent to pay for those benefits that the elderly receive would lead to a, a worker backlash, if you will, as they try to protect their after-tax wages. And that itself is inflationary. So we think there are a few angles, none of them ironically monetary, even though Milton Friedman had said inflation is everywhere, a monetary phenomenon, these real dynamics are quite a few, uh, uh, they're coming at it from quite a few directions, but they all seem to point, well, I shouldn't say all, but most of them seem to point in the direction of infl inflation, which gives us a little bit more confidence in the thesis. Um, I wanted to, uh, 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 Pete Lenzer, you, you, uh, I wanted to compliment um, you, the way these salons work is people come to us and say, hey, you know, this is a really original idea, or have you seen this or that, that, that uh, film or, or book? And, and Pete uh, uh, did that and put me on to your, uh, Pete, you wanna, you wanna jump in here? Uh, thank you very much for uh, 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 putting me onto this book because I, I think it's, it's, it's terribly original and provocative. Can you unmute? Uh, Max, can you unmute uh, Pete Lindsay? It's in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen. Max, can you unmute him? Me. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we see it. We hear you, Pete. Okay, I, I blanked out all my pictures and I don't know what I did, but I, I hope you all are much more uh, uh, able to work with these Zooms than I am. Um, I just see a perfect storm coming between the governments and, um, and the uh, central banks and the market. You're gonna have all these forces that you described are gonna be pushing inflation and you've got these uh, central banks and governments and the uh, public sector trying anything they can do to uh, keep the interest rates down. Because as we know, just in the bond market, uh, with the interest rates so low now that if you went from 1% to 2% to 3%, it'd be devastating, never mind the uh, debt service of uh, that that would mean. so. I don't know if you could make a couple of comments on that area, but to me, you got that uh, perfect storm coming of this uh, big battle between uh, the, the central banks, the public sector, 
and and what these market forces are bringing. Do you have any uh, remark comments on that? Well, again, politically, we think that uh, the governments uh, will be pressing the central banks not to raise interest rates for the reasons that you indicate. And because if they did raise interest rates, it would have such a devastating effect on financial markets and possibly drive everyone back into depression. And it's going to be extremely hard uh, for central banks uh, to raise interest rates, even if they should want to, uh, in order to um, uh, control inflation. And at the moment, uh, there's no indication that central banks uh, w will want to, in the short run, uh, because of average inflation targetry, central banks are saying, well, uh, we undershot inflation for so many years, it would be rather good if we have a short-term increase in inflation. Uh, they continue to argue uh, that after the blip, uh, that inflation rates will go back down to about 2%. Um, and this is an area where we think they're extremely optimistic. Uh, though, of course, nobody can tell them, foretell the future. Uh, I, the picture that we paint is actually not a very optimistic one. It's, it's a picture of a return to something like the stagflation of the 1970s. Uh, so for many reasons, uh, we actually have to say that we rather hope we're wrong. Uh, but the point that we do make is that we believe that we're telling a coherent story of what could happen and that those in power ought at any rate to think about what they might be able to do if our story did turn out to be correct. Peter, I had a small market-related point. In fact, John and I were speaking just before the call started. And one of the points I was trying to make is, is uh, when a central bank is, as markets would call it, behind the curve in that it does not really react in the way it should in order to keep a macroeconomic equilibrium that we have gotten used to over the last 30 years, stable growth, relatively low inflation, then markets take things into their own hands, which means that they start pushing up interest rates, uh, particularly at the long end. So the five-year, 10-year uh, becomes far more active if the two-year and the central bank rate are suppressed by monetary policy. And this then becomes very hard because the 10-year yield, particularly in the United States, is a global price. The US dollar is a global funding currency. Um, and those repercussions are felt across the world. Unfortunately, um, what then tends to happen if you want to avoid disruption is that policymakers, uh, both monetary and fiscal, will have to coordinate in order to keep yields low. But that doesn't prevent markets from pricing in inflation elsewhere. So if you look today um, at the difference between nominal and treasury inflation protected uh, securities, uh, what we call break-even inflation, the entire break-even inflation curve everywhere along all tenors is above the nominal interest rate curve. So some likelihood of yields being controlled by the central bank is already being felt by financial markets. As that happens in a more aggressive fashion, those break-evens will then signal the equity market and the credit market that inflation is going to likely affect your earnings profiles. And that will mean that they have to bear the price of it because nominal yields are being suppressed. So there is no real easy lunch whatever the central bank doesn't do has to be digested by financial markets. In some places, particularly in emerging markets, uh, um, not China, but most others, the markets can force the central bank's hand. But that's not true in places like the United States, Europe, or China. So they find a way to circumvent or to find different expression for that inflation story. And I think that's what we're likely to see. So um, uh, before we jump into, uh, we're, we've got a whole, we've got three or four different salons here. We've got a China salon, um, supply chain salon um but let's but we got paul horn here paul you were uh chief economist at the smith barney for years um you 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 have um why don't you weigh in here i'm sure can you unmute yourself john thank you thank you john uh just a quick correction there i was the chief international economist of smith barney uh taken over i would add by morgan stanley as you may recall um, 
couple of questions that you've raised, and that is the political, the fiscal and monetary response, and both of the necessary answers to rising inflation over time, you say is politically unpopular. Well, I would point out that Mr. Volcker found him found it necessary to be accompanied by bodyguards when he went to Wall Street, having raised the the interest rates to a, a dramatic point. And I think that could probably happen again, uh, except the, for the time being, the Feds and the ECB seem to have an allergy to triggering another great financial crisis in the asset markets. But I think they could get over that as the inflation rate starts to creep up. Uh, that raises a second question, and since real a potential real GDP growth has declined to under two percent in the U.S., Europe, and Japan, what and that's unlikely to change because of the demographics which you have described. What do you think is an appropriate medium to long-term inflation rate for a, a global GDP growth, which whose potential is at or below two percent? The third question, pardon me for overburdening you, is savings. I didn't hear a word about savings. What we've seen, particularly during the pandemic, is a very sharp increase in savings rates. And, and one of the phenomena in the United States is that since the 1990s, the uh, national and household savings rates has collapsed below the point necessary to finance investment in the United States. So we've been surviving basically on imported savings from Europe, J J Japan, and China. And I'm wondering if you don't think that there would be an increase in savings from the younger generation as perceptions of the aging phenomenon that you have described so well, and which won't change over the next two, three, four generations, if you won't see a sharp increase in the savings rate. Thank you. Um, John? Yes. Unless somebody's answering that specific question. I, I, I think all of us understand that this presentation um, is uh, of dramatically greater importance than a lot of other things that which have been said on this subject, at least as far as I can remember. By simply broadening the time frame broadening the time frame, uh, we have revealed truths by deepening it to put in the demographics. So I would like to make a series of sort of what you would call in Latin, dejecta, just random observations, which may have a mosaic meaning. First, you will notice that in Italy, the central banker moved in and took over the government. In, in, in Italy, of course, all the phenomena described are present in more acute form because of the extreme demographics, of course, the oldest population in Europe, because of the lowest productivity, because of the administrative dysfunction, and therefore the central banker has preempted uh, the thing. He now is going to take over the government. He's been given the promise of becoming president in a year and making it into an executive presidency, and that's it. That's, that has a meaning, I think. Second, um, the African factor, which is that the only people in the world making children are Africans. Um, how, uh, how would that affect not the content of what we have seen, the, what we, the, the scenario, but the speed of the scenario? Because what the scenario cannot tell us, of course, in any precision, is the speed at which these, these events are inevitable. But I think uh, the authors are perfectly aware of the fact that there are all these reasons that it's difficult to anticipate the speed of it. Uh, it raises a question that uh, a sort of selfish little question, which is uh, what is the uh, is simply purchasing land and gold the only possible remedies? The problem with buying land is that unless there is mass immigration with this demography, there won't be any pressure on land. And the, the issue regard to gold is going to be, of course, 
that golf historically has never provided a problem for these problems. Finally, um, there is, of course, a, a, I had hoped, because I'm a really nasty person, unlike all of you, I'd hoped that this, this uh, pandemic would reduce the pressure of aging on societies. But as, as you know, the numbers are very disappointing, even though the mass media proclaim the numbers are huge, of course, they're trivial. And they're so tiny that they don't affect the scenario at all. I, I can also propose uh, that I may be the only person in the world who has a remedy for this. And that is that everybody should convert either to the Amish version of the Mennonite creed of the Anabaptist branch of the Protestant church or to the Jewish Hasidism, because in both cases, females have a normal birth rate. Instead of the one to zero, they're four or five. If we have those birth rates, please understand that this is the shortest, fastest solution, because this could be implemented in about 20 years. If the conversions happened overnight, we would have children running around. Stepping back from that suggestion, I do note that it would be very strange if we expected industrial economies to continue functioning in an effective way when we no longer have the populations on which industrial economies were based on, which was, of course, the populations where women had three or four children, of which one died in disease, and one died in war. Instead, what we now have is one to zero. In other words, I don't believe that when these problems emerge as real, that they will be handled. They will, it will be possible to handle them with the normal means of, of macroeconomic and financial control. And I even don't think it'd be possible to do it with uh, Volcker, Paul Volcker, whom I knew quite well, I used to work for Reagan, as you know. I run into Falker quite a lot. What he did was extreme, but only it was a very short term measure. It was a very short term. It didn't last 10 years, 15 years. And so therefore, I don't even think that is going to be the solution. Uh, so I think that this book may be the most important book which has been published in the realm of macroeconomics in a very long time. And because it derives, it, the reasoning proceeds from things that are outside the normal sphere of macroeconomic analysis, one should not expect that the solutions can occur within the normal sphere of macroeconomic analysis. They have to be of a different order. I do have a question at the end. What about the role of the African population. The graph, and we've all seen those graphs, showing that basically uh, the only uh, population that is growing and becoming, uh, remaining young, uh, is no longer becoming younger as it was, but because of the infant mortality and so on, is the African population. How does that impact on a scenario? And when would it impact on a scenario? You want us to answer that, John? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ed is uh, okay, one of our most uh, creative uh, salon speakers. It's done uh, one on uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire and one on China. So um, I'm glad Ed appreciates the significance of your book, um, which I think is really, uh, thanks to Pete, um, it's a, this is really important conversation. So go ahead and, 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 and bite I'm, it that in any way you want. Let's start with Africa there. I, I bow to Manoj on, on, on this area. Um, let me take an example. Uh, Ethiopia was probably among the fastest growing uh, and many people thought the uh, leading light of African sub-Saharan countries. And look what's happened in Ethiopia over the last six months. And the problem is essentially governance. So growth is very largely 
uh, besides technology, a matter of governance and education. And the governance over large swathes of Africa uh, is simply, at the moment, not up to it. I look at Zambia, for example, look at Zimbabwe. Uh, I have a point on Italy. Uh, this is not the first time that the Italians have turned to a technocrat. My friend Mario Monti uh, became uh, the leader uh, of the government uh, in Italy. Uh, I think it was about a decade and a half ago. And Mario Monti put into operation uh, measures that were necessary and correct for trying to transform the Italian economy. But they were very unpopular because they involved such things as cutting benefits and raising taxation. And my fear is that when you introduce however good a technocrat, and Mariam Draghi is a, is a great technocrat, that they find that the only way that they can take the steps to bring Italy out of its difficulties are politically unpopular and they get kicked out in due course uh, for the normal run uh, of, uh, of politicians. Um, the, uh, I, I, I would, there was a very in good uh, question earlier about what should the potential inflation target be in future. I just, just quickly say that with the great benefit of hindsight, we'd have done a lot better if we'd had a, an inflation target of zero rather than 2% uh, in the years from 1990 uh, until 2020. Uh, when it comes to the future, uh, given that the world, in our view, is going to shift from one that is basically disinflationary to one that is basically inflationary, it might not be a bad idea actually to raise the inflation target to, shall we say, 3 to 3.5% in order to, be, to cut down uh, on the debt ratios uh, significantly. So anyhow, that's a, a, a quick answer. Uh, as for savings, one of the problems here is that the savings ratio in all our countries, as personal savings ratio, has now shot up. And one of the uncertainties about the next year or two is when normality returns, what will happen to the savings ratio? Will it go back to the normal level or will it stay uh, significantly higher than in the past? And the honest answer to that is nobody really knows. I'll add a few things. Um, I, I tried to make a list of questions that had come in. It's a very long list, but I'll try and be very brief. Uh, the, the thing I wanted, I found those questions really interesting too. The thing I wanted to mention about inflation with low growth is we have to be super clear about not mistaking this for the cyclical type of low growth. When you have low growth in a cyclical environment, GDP growth is below potential and creates a disinflationary gap, which tends to reduce the inflation by bringing the aggregate supply curve down. This is not what we're saying now. What we're saying is potential GDP growth itself has come down because of demography and because productivity will not rise as quickly, which means you're not creating an output gap. So just because you've got low growth does not give you a disinflationary impulse under a demography argument. It gives you that disinflationary impulse under a cyclical argument. So we do think low growth is consistent with higher inflation. And in fact, one of the wonderful papers that also set us on the path of writing this book uh, comes from Hamilton et al, who show you that periods of growth, uh, whether low or high, have very little to do with regimes of interest rates being low or high. So the connections between all of these things are actually a lot less firm than most people tend to believe over short horizons. Over longer periods, you can have all kinds of combinations playing out. Uh, as a longer term question on savings, we actually dedicate a fair bit of a chapter on this, where we argue and we show you some evidence in favor that savings tend to come under more pressure than investment because the elderly don't like to move home. Uh, something that I've seen personally and, and uh, Charles has argued forcefully as well. Uh, they tend to stay in their own homes. So the whole point that demography makes housing fungible, we think is just not true. What you see in Italy are deserted towns as the elderly move into city where their access to services and people looking after them is much higher. 
So it tends to increase the pressure on the cities. Young people don't stay with their parents, so new houses have to be held for them. And the elderly occupy the big houses that they bought when houses were cheap. So housing investment doesn't fall, but this savings do carry on because the elderly spend on healthcare. Uh, a few questions, I'll leave the uh, Italy one because I think Charles dealt with that and Africa very well. Uh, the pressure on land, I think we've already dealt with. And the last one I wanted to talk about was the endogeneity of fertility via policy. I think it's a splendid observation. Uh, it's just that what we've seen in terms of policy experiments to raise fertility has never really come from advanced economies where you would have an entire structure thrown at it. The two key experiments that we've seen uh, that haven't really worked was clearly one in Russia to encourage fertility where you were given the title of Mother Russia if you had a certain number of children and a far more populist policy in Hungary which is trying to encourage childbirth primarily because they want no immigration and they face uh, growing dangers of a much smaller workforce. So if you did come up with creative solutions that led to it also, what we also saw in China's one child policy is once you change family size, uh, it takes 20 years before people can actually reap the benefits of those changes. So what we do need is those kind of solutions definitely need to kick in and over a long period of time, they will certainly end up helping. But that, even if they do that 100%, at least the 10 or 15 years that we have until we get to that point, are going to be reasonably difficult. By the way, in the book, we also say that what we are saying is not inevitable. We think there are policy reactions to this, but we argue that most policymakers only take the right course of action when all other means have been exhausted, which means <laughs> some kind of crisis will have to come upon us before we wake them up out of their complacency and then they end up taking the steps that we think are the right ones. Uh, uh, Bert, uh, Ily, I see you have a, a monetary theory question. Uh, Charles is master of the universe on that. Um, do you want to ask your question? Okay. Uh, hope, can you hear me? Uh, uh, first of all, Charles, uh, good to see you uh, via Zoom. It's uh, It's been a while since we've uh, chatted. Um, and in the United States, there's uh, been a lot of conversation on the left about modern monetary theory or MMT. Uh, in, in, in the advocates of MMT argue that deficits don't count. Uh, the federal government can, um, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, uh, with, the, with the dollar can run enormous deficits uh, without uh, limit. Uh, and therefore the debt to GDP ratio could, uh, uh, could skyrocket. I'd be interested in what your, your thoughts are about the, uh, the validity of uh, MMT. Well, one of the things that I find extraordinary is that almost every central bank is now actually following MMT, while at the same time denying that it is doing so and arguing that it is a sort of policy. And the Fed is now very clearly saying they're not going to change a very expansionary policy until inflation actually is seriously there and they don't think it's going to be there. So we're in a world in which MMT is actually being being undertaken. Um, the problem with MMT uh, is the lags in the whole process. And the problem is that uh, if you wait for inflation really to take hold, it then becomes very difficult to deal with it. But of course, there's a counter argument and it's a very strong counter argument and I have very considerable sympathy with it, is that if you start tightening <coughs> before you see inflation rising, uh, you may actually uh, lead the economy to be much more depressed. And uh, the main uh, argument, the main problem with policy that was undertaken uh, after the great financial crisis was that policy tightened, particularly fiscal policy, far too soon. And so, uh, uh, again, and I think the Fed has been uh, felt damaged uh, by uh, tightening, first of all, the temper tantrum, the taper tantrum, uh, and then with Chairman Powell's attempt to tighten uh, in 2000, I think it was 18, and having to 
to reverse very quickly. And they now feel that the dangers are of tightening too early rather than tightening too late. It's, a, it's actually pretty much a matter of timing. It's a timing problem. Is it, too da is it more dangerous to tighten early or more dangerous to tighten later after inflation really has got going? Okay. We have uh, a couple questions here on uh, reserve currency. Uh, Del Spurlock has raised it and uh, Warren Coates here is our, uh, Warren, I've been talking about how to do a salon on the reserve currency because basically we, uh, we don't pay for all this military spending and stuff we do around the world with the Pentagon. Um, uh, we, we could pay for it uh, through um, raising our tax to European levels, but any party that did that would be voted out. So that's the committee talk goes where the silence is loudest and we, we get into the whole empire thing. And so, so you, uh, with the British experience, you, you guys ran a lot of debt up, had the biggest empire in history. Um, what do you, where do you think, uh, and you lost the reserve currency, uh, where, where do you think the, um, where, where is that in relationship? Who's going to win the race? The, the, is, what's the, what, what ways the causality work in terms of the great inflation? Um, and, and, and where does the reserve currency fit in? And, and Warren, don't hesitate to jump in and sharpen this. Well, let me say, start off, and I don't know what Warren feels. I think that is beginning to be a danger, just beginning, uh, that the expansionary policies in the US uh, should be so, have such an effect uh, on inflation and the exchange rate of the dollar uh, that the uh, dollar's central focal role uh, in the world's financial system could begin to decline. Uh, I, indeed, I could put it another way. I think that the uh, euro area and the ECB are actually now frightened that there could be a sufficient move out of the dollar into the euro that could raise the exchange rate of the euro sufficiently to make the European area uh, even more slow growing than it is already likely to be. Warren, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I, I will save uh, for a, a later time to elaborate on why I think the IMF's SDR, uh, in other words, an internationally issued reserve currency uh, has merit uh, as a way of diminishing the dollar's role and what the implications of that are. But, but uh, to the discussion that we just heard, I, I would uh, like to, to thank you both for a very stimulating presentation. And I, I look forward to reading your book. I want to agree with your suggestion that the inflation target for the previous several decades should have been zero, but I, I want to ask, what am I missing? Or why, why is it that the changing demographic, the aging uh, of China, the United States, Europe, that you document so clearly, uh, it isn't going to lower the savings rate more than you seem to suggest? After all, when people retire, their savings rate is negative. Uh, and I also want to take advantage just to say hello to Charles. Uh, three or four years ago or somewhere there, we were riding around together in Siena, Italy, on our way to Bob Mundell's place. And I don't remember whether Paul Volcker was at that particular gathering uh, or not, but it's very nice and very nice to, to see you here again. Good to be with you, Warren. I think the savings rate will go down. Um, but uh, the inflation rate will go down too. And that's one of the problems uh, with the outlook, which is that the de demography will reduce both the savings and the investment. And many of our uh, uh, critics 
uh, argue that the investment rate will fall further than the savings rate and that that will keep real interest rates low. Uh, to which our answer is partly uh, that they, those people who say that tend to ignore the housing point that Manoj has just made and also the fact that uh, a lot of offshoring will now become onshoring again which will hold up the investment rate to a degree, not enormously, but to some degree uh, within our economies. But the balance between savings and investment ex ante uh, over future decades is going to be a very, very uh, difficult subject. And it's hard to be confident to make prognostications about which will fall more. With a reduced labor force, relatively speaking, in the future, why wouldn't that put upward pressure on the investment rate? Because uh, uh, I, there are fewer machines per, I, you know, there are just so many machines that you can have per worker. And I think that there will be a degree of upwards pressure on, on investment. Uh, but I, we were reading this morning, Manoj and I, uh, an argument from a, 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 a good colleague of ours who was arguing that investment would fall uh, uh, even more than savings and that the slower growth of the labor force would lead to lower investment. Uh, you, know, you just need fewer machines per, because there are fewer workers, you need fewer machines. Warren, so one of the things we have um, a walk through is, and, and pardon me for jumping from global to local, one of the arguments we made was what had happened to push the real interest rate down in the global economy was that the advanced economies did not really need to invest as heavily, partly because they moved investment over to China. So what we saw in there is China had stopped capital inflows at its doorstep and hence did not allow financial assets to move into the economy, which would have equilibrated global interest rates. So globally speaking, uh, you know, investment and savings did uh, quite well. China on the one hand uh, um, uh, had massive amount of investment relative to its savings, which it had to repress. And the advanced economies had too little savings, too little investment relative to savings, which brought global interest rates down. Now, in the last cycle, uh, after the global financial crisis, what we saw was that the unemployment rate in the economy fell down very sharply in a straight line, but CapEx never really recovered. And that was partly because uh, corporate sector saw labor as a substitute for capital when labor was abundant and growth was not really strong. They preferred to do financial engineering to raise the return on equity. Uh, and that's what left us with a very tight labor market, but absolutely no CapEx. We are presuming, as Charles said, that some of this is going to turn around. But if you look at the last four decades, we have had a process of mechanization. It's just that the mechanization was in China and in emerging markets, which has led corporate sectors and the advanced economies to uh, uh, incentivize to invest less. Now what will happen is they will start investing more. But the pull that is happening towards labor is towards caring and towards the services sector which cannot have the same capital intensity as the manufacturing sector. In the manufacturing sector, you can possibly rule out 70, 80% of the labor that used to be involved in mechanized repetitive tasks. That is not true in education. That is not true in the services sector when it comes to healthcare. And that's why when you look at the economy as a whole, raising the capital to labor ratio to an extent that makes productivity the dominant factor in an economy, that's the difficult task that we face ahead of us. Um, could I make a point here? That was a very interesting point Manoj just made. There was a period when we solved the computer gap. You may recall in the 1980s, we had a lot of difficulty measuring the impact of computerization of the economy. And, and we began to get better at that. So by the beginning of the 1990s, we had a double digit increase in real capital spending in the United States, which led to a significant increase in the trend productivity rate, that is labor and capital productivity, which added something on the order of about a quarter to a third of a percentage point to our potential GDP growth all through the 1990s. So that was an example where, in fact, 
uh, investment, capital spending, one of the solutions you suggest is possible but unlikely might actually work. Actually, the, the, there's, the, there's a really interesting paper that I think you'd like to look at also, um, if you haven't already, on Vox EU, uh, EU Chiketti and Schoenholz uh, argue that uh, in the national income accounts, what is improperly measured is software uh, and what they call intangible assets. And that when you first invest in those intangible assets, it's called CapEx. But when you have training and further rollouts of those, those are called expenditures. And if you properly categorize that, then actually in the United States over the last 20 or 25 years, you have had intangible investment taking over tangible investment so that the aggregate investment level in the economy has been pretty good. Despite all of that, we have not been able to catch up with Japan on output per worker in the US, certainly not in the UK where productivity has gone down very sharply after the financial crisis. So we do think a lot of tasks are going to be automated. There is going to be a productivity increase, particularly because of localization rather than globalization of activities. Um, it's a matter of magnitudes. If we thought we could have a miraculous recovery, three, four uh, percent potential uh, increase in potential output growth, we would not be really as worried. But we think that's incredibly difficult. If you look at Japan, they had one percent GDP growth, a decline in the population on the uh, in the working age population of one percent, and the difference between the two was productivity growth of two percent. If we can hit something around that, that would be really good but we don't think that's enough to overwhelm the, the demography argument when it catches steam. That's, that's where we're coming from. So we have uh, uh, Pat Malloy and, and, and uh, Chaz Freeman, our, uh, our China experts. Um, um, Chaz, you, uh, Pat, want to jump in here and make a, some points about China? Or? I, I yield to Chaz and then I'll follow. Um, I actually simply want to commend the two speakers on the book and their presentation, which was very, very um, convincing. Um, I don't think this uh, session is really about China, uh, except as a factor in the global situation. Um, and I find it very interesting to think about uh, the consequences of the removal of China as a factor, uh, which is basically what you're talking about. Um, so uh, I have no comment other than praise, and I'm uh, very grateful to both of you. Very kind, Jess. Thank you very much. Pat? Um, Pat, you're, uh, you're muted. Um, yeah, it does. It does. It does. What they're saying really okay, it does now. impact the, our China debate. When we discuss China, the, the, these China salons, they're they're. It's not in this ever in this picture frame that that we've been given today. Um, one, I want to congratulate the authors for the, uh, their their book. I it was. I don't know whether you saw the article in the Washington Post yesterday by Charles Lane giving your book a big push called "Is Fighting Inflation Going to Get Tougher." Did you, did you folks see that article in the Washington Post yesterday, the authors? Yes, yes. yes we Charles did. Charles was interviewed for that one. I think hopefully you should be quoted there. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but we, we've seen yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's worth looking. Um, here's a question I have. The formula for GDP is when you run net ex, uh, uh, negative net exports, you detract from GDP and job growth, as I understand it. I'm not an economist, but I was on the banking committee for many years, I heard a lot of economists. So um, now, my understanding is the United States over say, the last 20 years has run about $10 trillion worth of trade deficits, probably about $5 trillion with, with, with China. And part of that was because our companies offshore production that we used to have here in the United States to the other country. And then we had to import things that we used to make or that we could no longer make. And the whole pandemic has revealed that and the executive order put out by the president yesterday on the whole issue of supply chains. Now, if we had had those jobs in the United States, wouldn't our workers have made more money, paid more taxes, would not have of our industries have paid more taxes. And we finance that trade deficit 
buy the other country, get the dollars and can buy and back our buy our bonds. So our 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 debt situation increased. So should part of the and so you're saying we're running the fiscal problem. Well, yeah. Would our fiscal problems be less if we balanced our trade? And would our would our, not our situation of debt be decreased if we balanced our trade? Because we finance our trade by borrowing. Is that is that is that is that something that you guys think makes some sense that we ought to balance our trade as part of how we avoid the, the calamity that you guys see coming? Excuse my my intervention, but you have that just backward. Uh, the the balance of payments surplus in China and the rest of the world is helping to finance the fiscal deficit. So if you close that, you'd make the financing of the fiscal deficit much more difficult. Uh, I've heard economists say that. And I, 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 I'm not sure it's correct, but anyway, I, I, I'd like the authors to, to speak on the issue, Warren. Thank you. Well, I, one of the problems with that is that uh, the shifting uh, production to China uh, was more profitable uh, for the corporations, um, and it was in their self-interest to offshore uh, and um, are you going to, uh, going to prevent corporations uh, by some kind of legislation from doing what is in their own profit? And again, the, the offshoring uh, actually shifted the supply chains to where the products could be made cheapest. So although there were many disadvantages um, of the kind that you pointed out. The countervailing advantage was that the American consumer got a lot cheaper products and had a higher standard of living than otherwise. And if you go back to the sort of basic uh, Ricardian approach about comparative advantage, it actually benefits everybody if you can have free uh, trade. The problem was, I think, not so much free trade, uh, but that uh, the process of free trade leads to uh, a balance between winners and losers uh, in each economy, and the losers weren't uh, protected. So the, the basic failure, uh, and there were, a lot of, there were a lot of failures, one of the main failures is the, you like, the tiny uh, approach to um, political control. Uh, but the, the other basic failure was a failure to uh, protect the living standards uh, of the workers who were displaced. And that was as true of the UK as it's been true of the US. You're, you're on mute again. Okay. Okay. Uh, let, just let me come back one, 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 one second. People have to understand that the, we moved from sh stakeholder to shareholder capitalism about the same time as, in the early 80s as these massive trade deficits began to accumulate. And so these corporate interests may have diverged from the national interest. We made a lot of people in the corporate world at the top quite wealthy, but we've impoverished our working people and, and, and created this enormous problem, political problem in our country. I, I, I just see we should be moving toward balancing our trade as part of the solution to the problem that you lay out. There's many political problems involved in the relationship with China, which I think is too big a subject to go into now. Um, but uh, I think that the the shift to what is known as a bonus culture, uh, whereby corporate leaders are trying to maximize the short term value of their equity because it pays them to do so, uh, is a concern. Um, I think if there had been more concern 
with the welfare of all stakeholders within the corporates, including the workers. Uh, and this is as true in the UK as it is in the US. Um, uh, the world would have been a rather better place. I think, the, I think there is an underlying concern about the structure of capitalism and the incentive structure for our corporate leaders, about which I have tried to write. And if you read the book, you'll see that there's some comments on that uh, in chapter 12. One, one small comment from me is just that it, if we take, there's not much we can do about the past. We are stuck with where we are with the stock of debt. Um, and perhaps things could have been different, uh, had some different policies been followed. But the one thing I wanted to say is that the future part of debt uh, will not change much if you have balanced trade deficits going forward. This is a story that is rising uh, where the debt uh, charts that Charles showed you are primarily aging related. Uh, they're not related to a greater or less engagement with the rest of the world. Uh, they're related with pensions. They're related to looking after the elderly. And that is when governments all over the world have not yet given adequate protection to those with uh, degenerative mental uh, illnesses. And that is something that is likely to increase in the future. So if we leave the past where it is and we look at the future, I think that story becomes far less important um, as we as we look at where the significance of debt is going to increase from in the future. Thank you. John, can I jump in here, please? Sure, sure. absolutely, Paul. Okay, uh, this uh, discussion is supposed to be principally about inflation. And uh, it's uh, been entirely about monetary policy. Uh, I wrote a book at the American Enterprise Institute a few years ago where I talked about the changes that took place between the 70s and the 90s in the American economy, where we basically opened up to competition things like telephones, trucking, railroads, a whole range of different very large industries, which, oh. which remain today, I think, very competitive. I think it's very hard to imagine more expensive phone service or telecommunication service. Even for every sector of the economy was opened up. The, the credit usually goes to Volcker, but if you check the record, most of this happened with Jimmy Carter. Uh, trucking, for example, at the end of 1980s and railroads and all of that stuff. And I, I think uh, the monetary, this focus only on uh, essentially monetary stuff ignores maybe the central insight of, uh, of economics, which is the role of competition. And I think competition here, kind of the Margaret Thatcher approach in UK, I think those things make this period likely to be much less inflationary than the 1970s. Do you have a... The, 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 you, you've seen the book by Thomas Philippon, I assume, uh, which argues that competition in the US has actually been reducing quite sharply uh, over the um, uh, last decade or two and you could call that. And under your uh, hypothesis, that actually would lead to more inflation. Um, I'm not really capable of, of uh, commenting on the Philippon hypothesis, uh, but there are certainly many who think that competition has gone backwards and who particularly refer to the tech, the, the huge tech companies uh, as being uh, very monopolistic. The prices keep falling in those areas. And if you go out to Minnesota, where I went a few years ago, you find that uh, there are now 27 people selling or companies selling uh, uh, copier machines. They used to be two or three. They used to be three car companies. Now we probably have 20 here. There used to be one phone company. We now have a great many. And this is sort of the bread and butter part of the economy. This is where 
Pat Malloy's people live and work. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think it's an, important, it's an important thing to talk about these microeconomic changes. Ed, do you want to? But I, the thing is that there are very differing viewpoints uh, on the degree to which competition is increasing. And I would just sort of, if you haven't read Philippon's book, I think. Oh, no, I have. Well, good. Um, and it's exactly the same with technology. And there are those who think that technology is going to uh, progress even faster. There are those like Bob Gordon who thinks that all the easy low hanging fruit have been picked and technological progress will slow down. Uh, I think the answer on both of these ones, we're not experts at that. And I must confess, I'm a, I'm a monetary economist. That's where uh, my sort of expertise, such as it is, lies. And I think that that has inevitably colors the focus of our book. Of course, we had Bob Gordon several years ago. It's very, Ed, you had a, a, yeah, a, a interjection is that where we have not had effective competition at all is in a sector which over the time span of this book has grown the most, which is medical services in the United States. Medical service in the United States feature no competition. There is very limited price knowledge, price discovery, and all that. And it plays a large, very large role, the lack of competition in that sector. Paul London has, is completely correct that in many other areas, competition has created, you know, dramatic, uh, in effect, price destruction, as the Japanese call it. But in, I wonder if that is true of the sectors which are now, have grown and will continue to grow because of demographic pressure, which is medical care, home care, all that kind of stuff. I don't see competition there at all. I don't, I don't see, for example, in the uh, assisted living industry, any emergence of new entities operating in new ways, generating new, you know, and this is a, a, a very significant problem. No, I think healthcare is a huge problem. You have local monopolies everywhere. Right. Uh, the fix is in for almost every piece, you know, uh, of the healthcare industry. And I don't know how to deal with it politically. It's, you can't get at it from Washington because it's so local. Yeah, well, I was comparing it to the Italian, the two, the two countries which emerged sharply in this COVID were Italy and Israel. In Italy, the, uh, as you know, the success of the Italian population in living very long collided with the state failure in providing the, you know, the de de uh, degenerated healthcare in the pandemic. Uh, but you, the fact is that the Italian hospitals still do not have billing departments. And therefore, you know, <laughs> this at least will not generate the levels of private indebtedness which you're going to see over here. In the Israeli case, they've demonstrated that by forcing, legally forcing the entire population to enter, to belong to competitive, competitive healthcare maintenance organizations gets you the optimal of having low costs and high results. So perhaps this would be one, this is not a remedy to the overall demographically driven scenario, but it happens to be a pretty big chunk of it. So perhaps a sectoral, a secular approaches might be possible to get out of them. Paul, what? Uh, yeah, uh, I think one of the solutions here uh, it has become pretty obvious over the last several decades, and that is there has been a generally successful campaign by the Republican Party in the United States to reduce taxes. Uh, and indeed, our tax load, total tax load, uh, obligatory payments, if you wish to use the OECD definition, uh, has been reduced to the second lowest together with Japan in the OECD. Uh, the other countries, in, uh, particularly in Europe, for instance, do not have not seen the same increase in the debt load, except 
excluding Italy, of course, that, that we have. Now, if we raised our tax burden a little bit, uh, it would help. The corporate tax burden is, uh, has been effectively far below what the official corporate tax rate is. Um, and indeed, uh, the income, the top marginal rates on individual income taxes has been well above 70% since the early, 19th, uh, early 20th century. And yet it has no correlation with GDP growth. If we increase taxes reasonably, we could do a lot better on servicing the deficit. Do you expect that to happen politically? Um, I think as your scenario plays out, I think it will become a necessity because we did find out in the 70s uh, and 80s, of course, that inflation is an easy but very unsettling uh, solution to a, a lack of savings or a high enough tax rate. Uh, I, I'd like to go back to Paul's point of the uh, Carter-led deregulation and increased competition and so on in the 70s and, and, and the 80s. Uh, and, and while the economy is a complex of everything that is going on, it is helpful to sort out or distinguish uh, real income growth and inflation. And what what the Carter, Reagan deregulation and increased competition and growth contributed to was more rapid real growth. The inflation was because too much money was chasing around that and Paul Volcker put a stop to that. So it is important to distinguish the monetary role from the real economy forces influencing real growth and price growth. So we, we uh, have uh, ended our lunch hour here, and I think we're deeply into your, uh, your supper hour. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think uh, this has been, uh, if this is a testimony to how interesting your book is. Uh, uh, you, you're to be really congratulated. This discussion could uh, keep, you, uh, keep you up uh, tonight. So uh, thank you very much. And um, anybody wants to send questions in we will continue this i had a number of things that i wanted to say but we've run out of time so um thank you so much uh, uh thank you superb thank you john thank you the guest thank you very much thank you thank you thank you Bye. good night good night, good night.